You guys mind if I stand? Everybody good with that? Yeah. Okay, cool. So Terrence Murphy, um, I'm here with my wife, my beautiful wife, Erica Murphy. She's my business partner in all my ventures. We've been married 15 years, three beautiful babies, 12, eight, and six. And um, thank y'all for having us. So we're excited to be here. And uh, this is our second time to be in Asheville. We bought our first commercial asset here in 2018. And I remember telling Erica then, I was like, this place is gonna blow up. It's just got all the right ingredients to be a really cool market. But before I start, um, I like to do this because obviously you've, I'm, you know I'm an athlete. So you've been in locker rooms and this is how we start all our meetings, right? So if I say, give me one clap, I need everybody to give me one clap. Say, give me two, so put your coffee down. <laughs> I don't want you spilling your coffee on anybody. So if I say, give me two claps, you give me two. What that does is it just sets the tone of the room, gets everybody on the same page, and then now our energy is going in the right direction. Y'all go with that? Yeah. All right, so give me one clap. A little better, somebody's early, somebody's early. <laughs> False start, somebody jumped off sides. <laughs> uh, give me two claps. <laughs> give me three claps. <laughs> give me two. <laughs> there we go. So once again, Terrence Murphy, Terrence Murphy Companies. We have 20 ventures in our, um, portfolio that we started and run, and then we have another 30 that we're invested in. So we're at about 50 plus companies. But before I get into any of that, I'll just tell you guys my story real quick. So born and raised in East Texas, grew up with a single mom, grew up in a really, really tough environment, really, really tough. My two older brothers went to prison for drugs and guns and things of that sort. And I had to make a decision. Am I going to go that direction? Or am I going to go a different direction? And the direction that God led me to was to focus on my books, and focus on sports. And so that's how I was able to get opportunities. I started my first business at 12 years old, which sounds crazy, right? And the, the usual kid has a, you know, a lawnmower uh, business, but my lawnmower business was commercial assets. So I had doctor offices, CPA firms, um, and, and I would go, my mom would take me to the city because I'm from the country, drop me off, I would mow those properties and I would sit under the tree and wait on her to come back and get me. Right, there was no cell phones, there was no calling, and you just, you wait, right? And what that taught me is when you want something, go get it. Now what she did is she pushed me. We went on a doctor's appointment, and she said, you've been talking about starting a business. All right, go. And I'm like, no, we're here, on a, we're here for a doctor's appointment. Like, I'm not here to pitch my business. She said, no, you're gonna go pitch right now. So at an early age, she just put me out there, and she's like, go pitch. And so literally, the doctor went and got all of the doctors, all of the nurses, and I'm sitting there as an 11-year-old, and he's, they're like, all right, now what is your business? So I had to pitch my business at 12. And I actually picked up three accounts that day. So, um, so I learned pitching really early. Um, the point of that story is uh, my second business was a card business. You're probably wondering why is Terrence talking about this? My mom passed in 18 and she kept everything. And she kept my whole uh, card collection. And so I have over a thousand cards in mint condition. And of those thousand, I have 200 Michael Jordan cards in mint condition. So I don't know if you guys keep up with that at all, but there was a Michael Jordan card that just sold for $400,000. I have that exact card. Now mine might not be worth 400,000, <laughs> but I have that card. And so I've been starting businesses. I've been a passionate about this. And so then I end up um, telling all my friends, hey guys, we gotta start focusing on our books. We gotta start really focusing on sports. This is our way out of here. And then obviously the next year, we bring in a new superintendent. And if you were at dinner last night, you might've heard the story, so I apologize. And that superintendent was brought in to clean up our community. So we had a lot of land and a lot of big developers moved to East Texas, started developing golf course communities. Well, when you bring in that kind of resources, they want what? You guys said it yesterday, good schools. So when they did that, the superintendent came in, started pushing and trying to get the drugs, the guns and all that out of our community. Well, what did it do to probably some of the best football players? They couldn't play because they didn't pass and they were making bad decisions. So we went from a powerhouse football program that we were winning state championships when my brothers were playing to where when I got to high school, uh, we went 0-10. We didn't win a game. Next year, we went 1-9. So going into my senior year, we were 1-19. Did y'all hear that? One game. 1-19. <laughs> now I'm walking around telling people, I'm going to go D1. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to go to these great universities. And we were one in 19, and I'm telling you, everybody in my community reminded me about that every time I said I wanted to go do something. They're like, you do know we only won one football game. And at that time, we hadn't signed a D1 recruit for 10 years. So no D1 recruit for 10 years, one in 19, 
and I'm telling people my vision and my idea for my future. There's a lot of bleakness going on, but I just stuck to the course and I really doubled down. And I'll tell you guys, there's a, there's a reason that God puts certain people in your life to help you elevate to your vision. And I wrote a paper in my English class uh, about what I wanted to do in my life, right? I want to go be a pro athlete. I want to go be an entrepreneur or whatever. And so my teacher kept me after class that day and she said, is this, are you serious? Is, do you really mean this? And I said, I do. She said, okay, so here's what I'll do. I'll help you, but you got to do the work. I said, I don't mind doing the work. Just tell me where to go and what to do. I'll make it happen. And so we started staying there after school and I started writing these letters to major universities, telling them my story, sending them, you know, my ACT scores, SAT scores. And then I started receiving offers from full ride academic offers for great universities from Rice, SMU, uh, UNC, obviously University of North Carolina. And so before I ever received an athletic scholarship, all of my scholarships were all academic offers. So long story short, fast forward, um, I go to Texas A&M. I have this vision to play wide receiver. I had played quarterback my whole life. I never played receiver, but I choose to go to A&M and play receiver. Everybody told me it was the worst decision, including my mom, my lover to death. She said, do not go to A&M, do not switch positions. But that's what an entrepreneur is, right? You blaze your own trail and you bet on yourself. And so I went to Texas A&M, never played the position. I graduated on a Friday. I packed my car up on Saturday and I went and slept on a guy's couch and started working out with the team. And once again, it just reminds me of entrepreneurship. Like you are willing to do what it takes to chase your, your dream and your vision. Get to Texas A&M, at that time we had freshman practice. So there was a whole week of practice before varsity ever showed up. And I'm on like the fifth team, just on the freshman team guys. And by the end of camp, I'm now on first team. I've worked my way up. You got all these five-star recruits and then you got me, this two-star quarterback that's never played the position. But what I had and what I focused on was my work ethic. I, went, I won every drill. If practice started at 5, I was there at 4.30. If practice was over at 7, I left at 8. I just outworked those guys. These guys showed up with this five-star mentality, and I showed up with an East Texas kid from Humble Beginnings ready to outwork everybody on the team. So by the end of camp, I was in first team. Then varsity shows up. These guys are grown men. You got to think, we're 18-year-old kids. These dudes show up 21, 22. They've been in the weight, weight room for four years. And it was like, where are we at? Like, are we in the NFL? What's going on right now? And so that was a shock. And so when varsity showed up, I get pushed back down the roster. I end up working my way up through camp by making plays and just outworking people. Even on varsity, I won every drill because they just, in their minds, I'm all American, I'm all conference. And I didn't have that mentality. I just had the attack mentality. By the end of camp, I end up being on second team. We play our first game at Kyle Field, and if you guys know anything about Kyle Field, it's the second or third largest football stadium in college football. And so we play, and, and the guy that's starting in the position above me, a senior, cramps up. And then they turn around in front of me, in front of 100,000 people, get in the game, Terrence. I'm like, me? <laughs> right now? A true freshman? And at that time, college football, you know, a true freshman didn't play. You redshirted. That was just a part of football. You redshirt, you wait your turn. And they're like, get in. Well, the beautiful thing that I had that no one saw was I was a quarterback. And remember, everyone, everyone told me, a lot of the other colleges told me I was making a terrible decision. A lot of my parents, my, you know, my family and my friends, you're making a terrible decision. But what I had, I turned to my game. I actually learned the whole playbook in a week. I knew every position because I had, I, as a quarterback, you do that anyway. So when I got Texas A&M, I studied every position. That gave me a competitive advantage. And so I really leveraged that to get on the field early. And long story short, we were down by six points in the fourth quarter with two minutes left. I get in the game, I catch the game winning touchdown in front of 100,000 people. And then that was my introduction into college football and into uh, Texas A&M. So that ended up being my story at A&M right there. So I usually, it's crazy because I've, I've been speaking for years and I've never really posted this, but I felt like it really made sense um, but two-time all-conference, two-time all-American, three-time academic, two-time team captain. I set 20 plus records and things that had never been done in my university, I set it. And I truly believe I was able to do that because of a different perspective as a wide receiver, right? I was able to see the game from a different perspective versus a lot of the other receivers only saw it from their perspective. Now you're wondering, why does that matter? I just think there's a lot of life lessons 
that we can learn through sports and entrepreneurship that we can teach our kids. And that's the reason that I feel uh, entrepreneurship was the closest thing that I could find when I retired to sports, right? I was looking for that next venture, that next opportunity, and I just couldn't find it. And I was like, okay, because I looked at coaching, right? But it's very political, right? Like, who do you know? Whose dad you coached with? And I, like, I don't have time for that. Like, if I put in the work, I want to see the results. And that's what I was used to seeing as an athlete. So those numbers may mean something to you guys, may not. But I'll tell you, when you do 3,000 in anything, that's a lot of yards. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of yards, a lot of running. So my ankles feel that every, every turn and cut. Uh, it was really cool back then, but now I'm feeling it. So I ended up getting drafted. And um, you guys know discount double check guy, right? Everybody heard of him, Aaron Rodgers. So he's our first pick in the draft. I was the second pick. We were roommates. Uh, he was a really good friend. We were drafted to be the yin and yang, right? We were drafted to be the next like Hall of Fame connection. And if you know anything about Green Bay, we'll be on the one yard line and throw the ball four times in a row, which kills me sometimes. <laughs> like just run the damn ball and get it in the end zone. But they bring in receivers, they bring in quarterbacks to throw the ball, that's our system, right? And so I'm there, I get drafted, it's all lining up. And my whole life, I told people when I was five years old that I would make it to the NFL. And people would brush me off. So think about something you've been telling your family members, people you grew up with, classmates, that you're going to start this business and they blow you off, right? There's opportunities that you've talked about, and that's why you got to protect it. Like, there, we all have a dream that we got to protect. And the reason you have to protect it is if you put that seed in the wrong soil, it will not grow. There will be no harvest. That soil will reject it. And so for me, I learned that. And that's, those are the same life lessons that I've translated into business. And I just want to pass on to you guys. Now, I know we're here to talk about venture capital. I know we're here to talk about investing. But this is just something that's been on my heart. So just taking those life lessons. So I get to Green Bay. I'm finally there. I'm playing with Brett Favre, a Hall of Fame quarterback. And I took the same strategy that I took to Texas A&M. And at that time, we had three Pro Bowl receivers, Donald Driver, Javon Walker, and Robert Ferguson. But one of the things that I learned is if I can learn this offense in the first week, which the West Coast offense playbook is this thick, and I'm not exaggerating. And here's the other thing. If you lose it, it's $50,000. So literally, if your cell phone goes off in a meeting, $10,000. You're late to practice, 25 grand. Your socks aren't upright, $10,000. Like they don't talk a lot in the NFL. They just find you or they cut you. Um, and so there would be guys in the locker room where you build a relationship with and you come back to practice and literally it's, their locker's cleaned out. It's like I was literally just talking to this dude at practice. And so what did it teach me? It taught me that the NFL is not for long and you got to take the lessons that you can learn. So I'm now in the NFL doing really well, playing with Brett Favre, roommates with Aaron Rodgers, traveling, doing all these great things. And, and then on Monday Night Football, um, number two in the NFC as a rookie, I'm literally on pace to, rent, to win Rookie of the Year. Not a lot of people know that, but it's life. And then this happens. Uh, I got paralyzed from the neck down on Monday Night Football in front of the world. And you're looking at me today like, dude, you're walking around, you're normal. Yeah, but it's been a process. So I've had neck surgeries, I have four screws in my neck, synthetic plates. Went through physical therapy, mental therapy, and all these things. And so what did that teach me, right? It taught me grit, self-reliance, grit, perseverance, and determination. Now, here's the weird thing. This is just, when me and Erica flew into Charlotte, it just like blew my mind. I haven't been back since I got injured. And so this is the week that that happened. And I'm here talking to you guys about it. I've never talked about this publicly because it's been something that I've mentally always had to fight and deal with, but I just thought, man, this is the week that I got injured. And I'm in Charlotte, I flew, I flew into Charlotte and drove in. And so what did I learn from this experience and what can we take from this? Grit, perseverance, determination, and faith. And I got a quote I wanna read for you from Will Smith. It says, the question is not can you handle the situation? The question is, can you handle your mind? Can you manage the thoughts and the emotions that are trying to poison your progress, right? Forget managing the situation. You have to manage your mind. 
And in this transition of being injured, a dream that I've dreamt, I worked my whole life for, I had to manage my mind. I knew I was mentally tough already, but this was a test. And when you're used to doing something normal for a long time, you can't, you gotta manage your mind. And through hard work, and the God has restored me, as you can see, I can hit a golf ball a mile, I can dunk, I can dunk a basketball, I can still do things that I was able to do before. I still have issues, but I'm grateful. And the point is, managing my mind in that experience. So we, are, we have to manage our mind, not only in life, like we're all gonna be throwing curveballs, right? We're all gonna have stuff that comes up, but how do we manage our mind? So how will you respond? The ultimate measure of a man or a woman is not where they stand in moments of comfort and convenience, but where they stand at times of challenge and controversy. So Martin Luther King. So when we're all dealt those cards, how are we gonna stand, right? That's what we gotta be thinking about because none of this is going with us, guys. I'm here to remind you. It's great, it's awesome, we're managers. We manage it, we're called home. So it's not whether you get knocked down, it's whether you get back up. And as you can see by that photo, I was paralyzed on Monday Night Football. Millions of people saw my injury. I was not moving. I didn't, get, I didn't get a chance to give the thumbs up to all my family members and fans. So all they saw was me being carted off, not moving. And I'll tell you, are you going to get back up? We all have things in life that we have. Like, there's just personal things you guys all have. We all have a story. But what are we doing to get back up? So my biggest prayer to God was to give me something that I could be passionate about. I didn't want to just do a job. I didn't want to have a job. I wasn't interested in having a job. And listen, I went second round in the draft. I, don't have, I didn't have Tom Brady money, but it gave me a seed, gave me a start on life. And I said, okay, I have a brain. I can do something with it. I don't want to be that athlete that just keeps coming back like Peyton Manny had three neck surgeries and just kept coming back. And I was like, I'm not doing that. I'm not risking that. And I just wanted to find something I could be passionate about. And he showed me real estate. So in 2007, I retired. You guys know what happened in 2008, the financial crisis. So that first three years at 22, so 2006, seven and eight, I was a part of Stillwater Capital as a limited partner. That was my first introduction into private equity and syndications and it's now one of the top um, P private equity syndicated uh, firms in Texas and you guys know the PGA headquarters there's a lot of companies moving to Texas I think uh, Governor Abbott said there was 30 fortune 500 companies in the last 24 months that moved to the state of Texas so they're flooding into our state right now well either way the PGA headquarters is moving to Texas and that group's uh, actually doing the development. So I was able to learn, I was investing with them, and I realized I had a passion for real estate. So I went back to Texas A&M, Mays Business School, started studying to get my MBA. And at that time, Sydney Donnell was one of the first ladies on the stock exchange. She came to run our program, and she started pivoting the program. But she saw something in me, so she said, Terrence, start auditing my classes, start doing this, here's some books you can read. And that really started my journey on reading. And when the 08 financial crisis hit, I told my, my financial advisor, I said, dude, I'm 23 years old. I didn't come from a lot. I'm not gonna watch what I've worked for turn to zero. So you gotta get my money out of the market. And he said, well, do you wanna take those losses? I said, if I'm gonna lose, I'm gonna lose on me. So let's get my money out. I'll take my L's and I'll go figure it out. And that night, Eric and I were dating. We were friends and dating at the time not engaged yet. And I said, let's go to Barnes and Noble. We went there with a grocery basket. I push it in. I just start pushing books in there, pushing books in there. Anything that was real estate, finance, entity structuring, whatever it is. And I read 40 books in about 16 months. I mean, I'm just piling in the information. So I called him back after reading one book and I said, I'm gonna do real estate. So that's when I went from obviously the NFL to real estate entrepreneur. And that's where it started. She got a job immediately. She was a double major at UT. And I, we moved back to College Station. And I said, I don't want to work for anybody. I want to work for myself. I don't know why. I just don't want to work for anybody. And so then I started a startup brokerage that people told me was crazy, very similar to most of my story. 
it's not going to work. It's a small college town. No one's buying real estate. You need a franchise. And I started TM5 Properties, and we scaled it to $1.2 billion in sales in eight years. And then from that point, we started spurring off these companies. So we, like I said, 20, 20 companies now, 30 ventures. But here's where it, the pivot really happened. So um, M&A, mergers and acquisitions. We got an offer from Berkshire Hathaway's group. So Warren Buffett's real estate arm is ran by Gino Bafari. He heard about what Erica and I were doing. It's just startup brokers. They're adding in some technology, innovation. They're scaling faster than any brokerage in Texas. Let's go see what they're about. So we connected, they made us an offer. And I told Erica, if they're making us an offer at this stage in our company, what am I missing? What can we do with this? And so I started really studying mergers and acquisitions and that's when I created my three pillars, sales, investing, and entrepreneurship. And then this, this model right here changed my life, intentional congruency. So this is a Japanese model that I started studying and it's Ka Retsu, Ka Retsu. So the Car Right 2 model is a conglomeration of businesses linked together by cross-sharing shareholdings to form a robust corporate structure. And in intentional congruency is a similar concept, but it's obviously more in our language. So the concept of intentional congruency is a simplistic idea that you can align all of your efforts to work in harmony with each other by expanding off of one main entity that feeds the other entities. So I took TM5 and I said, all right, how do I feed these other entities? And I remember thinking about, okay, I'm running out of runway here in College Station. We got one option, to sell to Berkshire Hathaway or some of the other companies trying to acquire us and expand with them throughout the nation. But if we don't take those offers, I told my wife, I gotta go start these other ventures in order to keep going. I gotta be pursuing something. So that's when we started these other ventures, right? We started ventures that could be fed by our main uh, venture. And so there was three kind of pillars that we, that we watched, right? So affiliated businesses own each transaction of a real estate transaction. There's about 18 to 20 companies that make money, right? So if you think about title, mortgage, survey, builder, home warranty, I can keep going, right? And so that's what we started doing. We started creating those companies or we started purchasing those companies. We started folding them into our company. We were doing about a thousand deals a year. We did 6,000 transactions in almost eight years. It's a lot of volume coming through our company. And we started seeing like, man, there's a lot of people patting us on the back saying, thank you for all the business, but there was nothing in return that we could show for it. So we started creating those companies. Then we started studying small businesses. And you guys know this, 40 to 45% of the small businesses and franchises in America right now are owned by baby boomers looking to retire. So there's a big opportunity coming our way. There's a, there is a wave of businesses that they don't have someone that wants the business in their family. They don't know how to package it up and sell it. They don't even know what an M&A is. And so there's opportunities there. And then obviously startup companies, that's what we're here to talk about. So small businesses obviously are the backbone of our economy, right? More than 600,000 new businesses are opening up every year. So there's a lot of opportunity there. And that's what we started really focusing on. And when I would mention the Koretsu to my team, they were like, what the hell are you talking about? But I'm like, I'm telling you, this is a model. I'm telling you to study it. We can build off of this. And so it's like spider webbing, right? You put the main business structure in the middle and you just spider web off of it, but you feed each business with that. So a few company highlights, I'm gonna go quick and then I'm gonna dive into some other, other stuff. So I know, I know I don't have much time. So these are just a few of our companies. So TM5 team, we talked about it, 1.2 billion in sales in eight years. We ended up merging it with EXP. Now we're expanding it around the nation. So in the first 15 months, we're in 20 states and we're in two countries already. We plan on being in all 50 states and in 25 countries. And in our entity alone, we'll have 10,000 agents in the next five years. We plan, on be, we plan on doing a billion in sales a year. And that's where we're headed fairly quickly. Just in Houston alone last week, in the last two weeks, we brought in 75 agents. So at that kind of rate of 75 to 80 agents every two weeks, you can see how we get to 10,000 fairly quickly. And then Murphy Singleton Homes is, so I've been building and developing for 15 years as something that just kind of naturally started happening. So people would always ask us, can you help us do what you do? And I would always refer out the business. So we went ahead and started it. We're set to 20X this business uh, in 2023. It's already on the books. So we're going, we went from 1 million in revenue to probably 21 to 25 million in revenue in uh, 24 months. So we're, we're, we're gonna 20X that business. And then TFI Development Group, that's where I cut my teeth when I left Stillwater Capital. Just urban development, 
one of the things that I realized is if you can find the right locations and get out in front of what's coming, you guys know location, location, location. I actually hate that saying, but um, real estate agents wear it out. They kill me. Uh, and I am a realtor. So urban development in that sense, really understanding what's coming, what's coming. And you know, what we did is we would go over that one mile radius of campus, which at that time was a sleepy university. Now it's the biggest public university in America from an endowment standpoint, from a wealth standpoint, from a size standpoint, and from an enrollment. Um, so 75,000 students now at Texas A&M, the campus is 5,300 acres. So if you guys know anything about UT's campus in Austin, it's only 40 acres. I just want to throw that out there real quick. <laughs> just want to put that out there. It's only 40 acres. My wife went to UT, it's all up. We're 5,300 acres, they're only 40 acres. All right. So we started going in, buying up stuff, rezoning, and redeveloping, going vertical, and that's where we built a really considerable portfolio of student housing. And then we partnered up with Golden Bear, which is obviously Jack Nicholas is one of the top golf course community developers in the world, and we're doing developments alongside them, and that's done really well. Team Five Equity Partners. So for 15 years, people have asked to invest in our projects, and we've built these ventures and our uh, real estate developments, and me and my wife never raised any money. It's all just been our family. And this year, after 16 years or 15 years, we just started raising capital for our multifamily deals, commercial deals, and obviously in investment stuff. So we're raising a new fund, which I'm going to be talking to KP about, um, sending in some assets to him. Good boy, we're raising $100 million to invest in tech startups, real estate, and acquiring small businesses. So top five sectors to watch, fintech, prop tech, ag tech, construction tech, and M&A. So, Somebody asked me last night at dinner, what do you look for? This is what I look for when I'm evaluating businesses. It seems very sim simplistic, but obviously there's more to it. But can we add value from our portfolio of companies? Is there any intentional congruency that we can add? So day one we go in, we're not just investing, but I know you guys were talking about the other day, like being a pilot. I think that's a great idea, but we love being a pilot, right? We're still kind of in that startup world. We, we, we're not really, really big like some of the other companies. So we love being that pilot and really trying it out, trying to break it. And so that's been something that's worked well for us. And then is it something that I have a genuine passion to understand, like that folds in? And then does it solve strong pain points in the industry through innovation and technology? Real estate holds the key to what's, where we're headed, right? That's what we're here to talk about real estate technology. Um, I, I think the industry as a whole, we talked about it yesterday, that statistic and that's, that slide on framing it was mind blowing. I took a screenshot of it just showing that we're still framing stuff the same way with the studs and stuff. But if you look at ag tech, prop tech, it, we're all, all those sectors are struggling. But that's why innovation and technology are key because we're competing against other industries now. We're not competing against our own industry. When someone can sit at home and press a button and something gets dropped off at the door, when they can walk out of a hotel and press a button and now they're not putting their hand up in New York, there's a car that pulls up and picks them up. They're used to different consumer experiences and we have to curate that through technology, repeatable processes, and how do we create a experience that is second to none. And so that's what we're focused on with our companies. Some quick stats, we're still one million homes short in America. You guys heard this uh, in AHB statistic. And then there's 1.6 million realtors in the US. So there's a lot of people running around. And so it's crazy. So there's a lot going on. And I think as the market pivots, we are talking about six and 7%. But if you were in the market before 08, we're normalizing, right? We're just getting back to where the market was. And I always tell people when we're dealing with buyers, they're like, well, why should I buy? The market's this, the market's that. It's better than 100% interest. So you can pay six to seven percent interest or you can pay a hundred percent interest. And so my last quote I'll close with is Robert Hertrovet. Entrepreneurship is the great equalizer. It's not about who your parents are. It's not about your color. It's not about your sex or your religion. Business doesn't really care. Business only cares about the value that you add. So, so I got a question for you. Um, obviously sports is going to be kind of Yeah, it's a great question. I think sports sets up um, this perfect picture for a lot of athletes, but I actually started a nonprofit, my wife and I, we do a Terrence Murphy Camp Football, Finance and Faith. 
where we're investing in kids in un underprivileged communities, teaching them about how to leverage the game of sports and how to, how, to, how to think about financial literacy like right now at five to 18 years old. And, but only 1% of athletes go pro and the average career is two years. So I think what that does, it sets up this like terrible uh, image that we're all gonna be the next Michael Jordan and it's just not, it's not possible. It's just not, the numbers don't match. So we're trying to get athletes to understand and we're trying to get universities to understand. I'm speaking to a lot of universities right now about creating transition programs because even if you play 10 years in the NFL, you're still 32 when you retire. That's a young man in business. And so really trying to get them to understand that there needs to be a transition program in place. It's a good question though. Eric, what's the, uh, what's the biggest mistake you see with athletes trying to understand personal finance and how to, how to manage their money? Yeah, it's a great question. So the one thing we have as athletes is we have a lot going on, right? There's a lot of people pulling at us there's a lot of attention coming your way. And I remember I had trash bags and trash bags full of information and emails and, I mean, handwritten letters and just stuff from agents. And I remember getting out of practice one day and there was a guy sitting in like this maroon Escalade, brand new. And I remember I told you guys, I stay after practice. I, I'm, I never let anybody stay longer than me. And so I was the last person walking off the field and this guy's sitting there and he's like, hey, Terrence, and talk to you and I like go up and he's like hey man I want to have you have dinner and it was it was an agent right and I said some choice words that y'all probably don't want to hear right now um, but I told him to pretty much get his ass out of here um, but the point is they're trying to get to you early and then they want to get you with someone else and so one of the things I'm pushing a lot of high net worth individuals that I work with we have family offices and stuff that we work with is these athletes just think, I just need to focus on being an athlete, but it's like put that same energy into your financial literacy journey. And I don't think without my injury, I would have did that. I probably just would have been playing and trying to be a Hall of Famer pro bowler and have financial team doing it for me. So just trying to get them to understand you need to put some energy towards it. And that's why you see, you guys have seen the series broke, where these guys are making 50, 100 million dollars and they're broke because they just gave it to someone else. We talked about, um, you know, about risk entry and entrepreneurship that anybody can really be successful there. That's not so true in real estate. There's a lot of real estate families that have a built-in advantage. Can you speak to that and how you enter the real estate industry and how that worked out? Yeah, I just believe that um, there's always an opportunity. It depends on what level you get in, but getting in, just getting in the game is the key, right? And I felt like if I can just get those experiences, like I can go learn in the classroom, but if I can get those experiences, I can build on top of those, right? So now, you know, we just closed a $45 million apartment complex, uh, 240 units in Dallas two weeks ago. But that wasn't my first deal, right? My first deal was a package of duplexes that we bought for $78,000. Now that dirt's worth 500K a lot, but at that time it was worth 75,000. So I think just finding your entry point that you feel comfortable with and then just building on top of that. Because you can't come in day one and compete with Trammell Crow, right? or Berkshire or whatever, it's just not gonna happen. So finding your space and creating that, you know, that vision for it. Yep. Can you be sticking around a little bit? Yes, sir. Yeah, so feel free to find Terrence. Thank y'all so much, man.